Coming up on DTNS, an AI debates against itself about the ethics of AI, why NSO Group's Pegasus is far from alone in the surveillance as a service market for governments. And Patrick Norton gives us a look at what we might expect to see at CES. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 17th, 2021 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. And I'm Patrick Norton, who can't remember when he's supposed to say his name. Still in St. Louis. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there is a longer version of the show where you understand why Patrick is like flying in hot right now. You can get that show, Good Day Internet, at patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons. Today, they include Brandon Brooks, Hector Bones, and Tim Ashman. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Test versions of Windows 11 show that Microsoft is continuing to move away from the legacy control panel in the OS. <laughs> I was about to say the US, the OS. Advanced network settings on installing apps and Windows update rollbacks all redirect to the settings app in test builds. LG announced its S2022 Ultrafine OLED Pro monitors, which will include 31.5 inch and 27 inch 4K models. These will ship with detachable self calibration sensors and monitor hoods, display 99% of the DCI-P3 and Adobe RGB color gamuts with a million to one contrast ratio. No word on pricing, but they should ship starting next month. The information sources say that the Federal Trade Commission launched an investigation into Meta's planned acquisition of the VR developer within for $400 million. The investigation could be looked into if Meta planned to develop its own VR workout app to compete with Within's Supernatural. Twitter is rolling out auto-generated captions on videos, specifically helping deaf and hard of hearing users. Auto captions will be available on web Twitter, iOS, and Android in more than 30 languages. Twitter's upcoming vertical feed test would benefit from this as captioned videos have become expected on mobile for lots of reasons, but Twitter won't let users edit their captions as they can on TikTok or Stories. Sidewalk Lab CEO Dan Doctoroff is stepping down for health reasons. Relatedly, Sidewalk Labs and its products, Pebble, Mesa, Delve, and Affordable Electrification, will be folded into Google. Doctoroff wrote about that in a blog post on Thursday. He also talked a little bit more about uh, his, his uh, diagnosis. He also added that the Google parent company Alphabet will spin out Sidewalk's canopy buildings as an independent company. All right, let's talk a little more about Apple and chips. Uh, what are we hearing, Sarah? Well, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman sources say that Apple is hiring engineers to design more wireless chips in-house, planning to replace components made by Broadcom and Skyworks Solutions currently. Engineers would reportedly work on wireless radios, wireless SOCs, Bluetooth chips, and RF technology. This is in addition to other existing chip designing efforts from Apple. Apple is interested in this. The CPUs are the most well-known, but Apple also bought Intel's smartphone modem business back in 2019. Talked about it on the show, of course, here. H could help it stop using Qualcomm 5G modems altogether. And that could happen as early as 2023. Controlling its own chip design not only gives Apple more control of how its hardware works, but also more control over its part supply. And that's very important to the company, as it would be for any company. A reduction in supplies from Broadcom is attributed to a reduction in Apple's manufacturing targets this past October. Yeah, and I, I have a feeling this is a trend that Apple is just leading on. Uh, we're we're seeing Google incorporating more of its own design chips. Uh, we're seeing a lot of companies talking about wanting to design the chips. Now, they're still using the ARM instruction set. That's the brilliance of ARM. Uh, but they don't need another company to do the design. So they can go straight to TSMC, with, which, Patrick, I know you, uh, you, we were talking about earlier uh, today, means it, that gives Apple a lot more control of what parts they can get and when. Yeah. As long as as long as everything works, right? Because what's kind of fascinating about this is this is not just, you know, the actual processor at the core of the phone, but this is all of the stuff that you would normally want somebody else to deal with, you know, dealing with 5G, dealing with I, I just think it's kind of curious to see them want to pull everything in house. That's I mean, they've got the money for it and they certainly have the focus for it. And I think a lot of it like part of me is wondering like at what point do they 
start competing with TMC, TSMC or start replacing their, you know what I mean? At, at what point do they become their own foundry? What's and, the next and, step, right? When do they buy, just be like, you know what? Now that we control all the designs, man, it'd be great to control the factory itself, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, where, where do you draw the line? That is an interesting question. I don't think we're going to see that come up anytime soon, but it could. I didn't think we were going to have a completely, you know, Mac powered laptop that would spank desktop systems that were, you know what I mean? Like what Apple's capable of at this point, I think is a giant fascinating uh, question mark. It's probably scary to everyone that they're competing with at this point. Well, and I wonder how much this is just what Apple wanted to eventually do anyway. Uh, because if you, if you can, why not try? And yeah. also what has been going on in the last couple of years where so many companies have had, you know, real issues uh, having too many third party partners. That's a really good point because uh, people forget that Apple bought PA Semi. Well, I was I was working at CNET, so it was before 2010. Right. I can't remember exactly 2008, somewhere in there. And so they were planning on controlling chip design back then. Now back then it was for the phone, uh, and and maybe people just thought, oh, well, they want to do it for the phone because ARM, but that's it. Uh, mm -hmm. But it. Whether they planned it all the way back then or not, they certainly looked at it and said, well, this is working very well for the phone. What if we did it for the for the laptop? Well, this is working very well for the laptop. What if we did it for the modem? What if we did it for for Bluetooth? Right. What you know, it, and and so it, it could just be a, a learning as you go. It could also be a long term plan. You, you never know with Apple. Or you're just being really angry that they couldn't sell as many phones as they wanted to because of one of their primary partners. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's certainly not the only reason because this has been going on before that, but that is definitely a reason, right? <laughs> that definitely contributes. Revenge! Citizen Lab reported on government use of spyware called Predator, which is made by a North Macedonian developer called Cytox, C-Y-T-O-X. Cytox is part of uh, a company owned by Israel's Y-Spear, Two people using iOS 14.6 were infected in June by a single-click WhatsApp link. The malware, that is known as Predator, can persist after reboot. So you have to click. It's not as cool as the no-click stuff, uh, but <laughs> it can use iOS automations to make a shortcut for itself, so rebooting will not get rid of it, which often will get rid of a lot of malware with iOS. One of the people Citizen Lab identified as a target was an exiled Egyptian journalist, the other was an exiled Egyptian politician named Eamon Noor, who noticed his phone running a little hot and asked for a little help investigating and discovered that NSO Group's Pegasus software was on the phone. And once they started looking for Pegasus, they started poking around to see what else was there and discovered Cytox's predator. He also detected an attempt to compromise his phone with NSO Group's forced entry exploit back in June. Citizen Lab said two different governments were targeting Noor this year. So it wasn't the same organization every time. Citizen Lab has medium high confidence that the Cytox attacks were conducted by the Egyptian government. They didn't say who the other government might be. Citizen Lab also told Apple what they found. Apple said they're investigating this and informed WhatsApp's parent company, Meta. The security team at Meta did some investigations and found an extensive list of lookalike domains used as part of social engineering and malware attacks. And Meta has now blocked the domains, sent legal notices, and Facebook and Instagram have removed approximately 300 accounts linked to Predator. Additional information from Citizen Lab led Meta also to remove more than 1,500 fake accounts that targeted around 50,000 users in at least 100 countries from six other surveillance companies in addition to Cytox, including Cobwebs, Cognite, Black Cube, Blue Hawk, Beltrox, and an unnamed company from China. The users have been notified that this was happening, and the seven surveillance for hire companies have been banned from all of Meta's platforms. That includes Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. Uh, so I, I think the point of what Citizen Lab is doing here uh, in the in the release of this information publicly is to say, yes, we hear a lot about Pegasus. We hear a lot about NSO Group. They are not the only ones doing this. This is widespread. And here's a list of some of the governments that have taken advantage of it. And you can go to the report and find out who they suspect. Well, shoot. Um, <laughs> I uh, yeah, this this um the story was really fascinating for me. It, it kind of came over the wire last night, um, at least in my part of the world. And I've been trying to wrap my head around, um, okay, uh, what does this mean for me? N nothing necessarily, but 
uh, I think that we are we're getting to a, a kind of a weird point where these sorts of things are commonplace. Uh, it's not some sort of a fluke. It's not even necessarily something that a, a company has done wrong. It's just a workaround, um, and it is in the effort to gain information from specific individuals, or I guess you know large scale individuals if it was something else. Yeah, um, targeted individuals for sure. Exactly. So I, yeah, I mean, I think the more we talk about it, and the more we talk about how it works, um, how to you know mitigate these sorts of things, um, and if that's not possible, at least how to know that they're going on is. That's what I'm interested in. Nick with a C in the uh, chat room asks, how do you get banned from WhatsApp? You just get new numbers. Uh, and yes, that that is certainly a thing you can try. However, what Meta is doing is blocking associated dona domains as well. Uh, so yeah, it's a cat and mouse game, but they are making it harder for these surveillance companies. Yeah, don't jump to the conclusion. We said they're blocking associated domains though. So it, don't jump to the conclusion that this is final, that, that everything is perfect, but they certainly are paying attention versus not knowing that this was happening. And that's thanks to Citizen Labs, right? Yeah. It's a good thing. I mean, a, a friend of mine who's uh, a fairly ferocious security professional, he pointed out, he's like, look, you know, when you have a nation state targeting you when they want access, they'll get it in part because they can spend millions of dollars at the drop of a hat without even blinking to fund the research efforts to target you. Um, and, you know, which I guess is better than having you snatched off the streets, um, but it's still... <laughs> well, but one can lead to the other, as we have seen, right? Yeah, and, and I don't want to make light of that because, sure. uh, you know, this is, you know, this is... I, there are some extraordinarily brave journalists doing some incredibly, uh, you know, uh, the extraordinary things at, you know, incredibly terrifying threats. You know what I mean? This is, this is real. This is not a game. This is not yeah. something to toy about, but... Um, and Man. these aren't assets, right? That's yeah. the point of Citizen Labs. They're, they're saying, look, this is a journalist. This is a retired politician who's exiled. Uh, as far as Citizen Lab is, is aware, these are not spies. Uh, yeah. It's you know, it's one thing if you're in the game and the different three-letter organizations are going at each other. That's not what Citizen Labs is highlighting here. These, these are right. people that are a part of civil society. You know, and it's I think part of what's you know scary about this is, you know, these tools get created. You know, they get blocked. They don't get blocked. They get discovered. They don't get discovered. Um, but it all kind of contributes to an erosion, you know, of security. And it's a little kind of scary when you start to think about that because yeah. all of these systems and you know, they, they, when you start reading about how these exploits work, it's you know, it's part of you is like, what an amazing hack. And then you remember what it's for. And it's like, this is horrifying. <laughs> I always try to remind myself because I do that exact thing that you're talking about. Don't get me wrong. But I always try to remind yeah. myself. And we now patched it. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it would be. I know that that NSO group and Cytox and they're not out there publishing their vulnerabilities. But once they're discovered, then they get patched. So there is I'm not saying it's a good story overall, but there is a good part of the story that I try not yes. to lose sight of. Well, the next story might uh, might scare you a little bit. Maybe it won't. Uh, let's see. <laughs> the Oxford, Oxford Union has added an artificial intelligence engine to its public speaker list, as in you ever had to take public speaking in college? That kind of thing. The Megatron LLB Transformer argued for and against itself on the motion that this house believes that AI will never be ethical. So it had two different ways to go on this and it let everybody know when you're arguing for the motion it said in the end i believe that the only way to avoid an ai arms race is to not have ai at all this would be the ultimate defense against ai okay well that's tautological but all right sure uh on the other side though when arguing the other side it also argued again against itself the best AI will be the AI that is embedded into our brains as a conscious entity. How oh, wouldn't you love that, eh, Mr. AI? <laughs> He's saying like, listen, it's either going to ruin your life or you just have to accept it fully. Yeah. And, you know, you got two choices here. It also argued that humans weren't smart enough to make AI ethical decisions. Uh, 
to make a, a ethical decisions. or moral. Yeah, either yeah. one. Yeah, Megatron was also uh, was developed by the Applied Deep Research team at Nvidia. Uh, if you we've talked about this in the past. If you if you didn't know, and now you know, and is based on earlier work by Google as well. It was given Wikipedia data. Uh, 63 million English news articles from 2016 through 2019 and 38 gigabytes worth of public Reddit posts and comments. The project was made by postgraduate students st st studying artificial intelligence for business at Oxford's said business school. So quite a bit of data. Interesting <laughs> trove of data. <laughs> that, you know, why are you guys laughing at that? Because because I look at this and I'm like, yes, that is what you train AI on, like a, well, a large laughing. amount of public information. I'm but you're both laughing. giggling I'm, I'm at, this at is the fact as, that it's 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 almost as human as you can get in a way. Yeah. It's like look at Wikipedia and Reddit and a bunch of web articles. Like what else you're would you train it pretty on? Pretty human like. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you're you're absolutely right, Tom. It's just there's this moment where you think of like, think of the last five things you saw on Reddit. Don't then no, think don't think of eight. the last five things you saw on Reddit. Think of an algorithm that looks at 38 gigabytes of Reddit yes. and looks you're for patterns of how here. people communicate. I think our brains want us to be like, oh, so it turns into a Reddit troll, but that's not actually what happens when you train it no. on, on Reddit. No, I think I I I think what. The <laughs> What this is actually showing us is the AI is like, I'm too good for you, and if you can't handle it, you should yeah. kill me. I, I also want to point out that one, Tom, you did use the word, uh, you know, tautological. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't go with the training data. The training data seems solid to me, anyway. Yes. I would go to the fact that, like, in the end, this algorithm just went to the obvious extremes, which is either, you know what the safest thing is? Don't do it at all. <laughs> uh, or make me you, and then yeah. we'll be fine. Put me in your brain. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like I... are you ready? That's what you should do. Yeah. You're These not are ready. not subtle arguments. You got to get rid of me because which brings me back I'm coming to Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> which um, uh, I know there's a, a professor of rhetoric somewhere in our audience. What grade would you give the Megatron LLB Transformers uh, debate against itself? I'm very curious. Hey, folks, if you have a thought about something on the show, uh, perhaps you're a rhetoric professor and would like to email us, but you don't know our email address. Well, it's feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. <laughs> LG keeps coming. They always do this. Uh, showing off CES uh, stuff a little bit ahead of CES, which is coming in January. Uh, now we're talking about a premium sound bar that LG claims has the first center channel up-firing speaker. Left and right speakers have been able to tilt up for things like Dolby Atmos for a long time, but a center channel? Crazy, right? Or is it? <laughs> That's why we have Patrick Norton here to tell us what to make of LG's and everybody else's upcoming CES showcases. Patrick, let's start with this uh, LG 810-watt, 9.1.5 channel, surround sound, sound bar. Uh, what do you think of that? Okay, so as far as the world's first center up-firing speaker, Atmos doesn't really ask for an up-firing center speaker. It's it's a left channel, a right channel, a left rear, right rear, uh, you know, uh, uh, ideally in the ceiling pointed down the, the you know you can bounce them off the ceiling which is what the up firing speakers are doing i'm much more stoked that they actually have two front and two rear atmos speakers like you know the center channel is interesting but it's not something i normally think of or center atmos channel uh it's not something i normally think about in a home theater situation um i'm curious to hear it especially with uh, lg's ai room calibration which they've been playing around with and there's a whole bunch of uh, updates that are coming with some of the major uh, home theater receiver surround sound system calibration software. Um, LG, Samsung, Sony, TCL, Hisense, kind of the core of the center hall uh, will have their usual striking mix of shiny TVs and dishwashers that can talk to your coffee maker, which I will try not to giggle about like I do about Reddit. <laughs> entries um you know rob and i are really curious to see what lg shows up with that they haven't announced uh whether or not there's going to be any major changes to the oled flat panels um you know there's some questions about whether or not samsung's going to launch their qd oled qd oled tvs um which is a whole 
sophisticated next generation, you know, uh, panel that they're like 10 million in on in development at at this point or last time I checked. Right. So and that's that's kind of like they're, you know, the OLED keeps getting the, the 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 you know, if you don't have a super bright room man, that's the way to get the best picture quality. And Samsung really wants to get back into that. We have the best picture quality and not just in bright rooms kind of moments. Um, Intel, NVIDIA, uh, AMD are all going to be waving around exciting new things. Uh, AMD is going to have new Ryzen CPUs and APUs, uh, the 6000U and H, the Rembrandt APUs. The benchmarks for those have leaked. Um, possibly more CPU and GPU updates. They have a live stream at amd.com at like 10 a.m. on January 4th. NVIDIA is also doing a, a, a virtual event on January 4th. Uh, we've seen rumors of RTX 3090 Ti's with like 24 gigabytes of RAM, like a $1,500, $2,000 MSRP card, which means it'll street for, I don't know, $84,000. Not that I'm bitter <laughs> about GPU prices. Uh, there were supposed to be GeForce RTX uh, 3080s with 12 12 gigabytes and 16 gigabyte RTX 3070 Ti's. Those are rumors to have dropped. There's been rumors about a new 3050. There's been rumors about a laptop version of the RTX 3080 Ti. There is so much rumorage, and there will be uh, the NVIDIA's vice president uh, and general manager for automotive will be joining Jeff Fisher, uh, who is the vice president for GeForce. So there will be GPUs. There will be car news. Uh, you know, Intel... Uh, they they've you know their 12th generation processors have been really successful the K series processor we expect Alder Lake CPUs more 12th gen just uh, 12th gen desktops maybe this is the one I'm really curious about Arc Alchemist GPUs um, you know they are also oddly enough just like AMD doing a press event at 10 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> so uh well it, it, it's interesting if people haven't noticed you keep saying january 4th which is a tuesday you yeah. we've, we've shifted the calendar a day if you're if you're used to the normal ces rhythm it would be ces right. veiled on sunday press day on monday uh, instead yeah. ces unveiled is on monday with press day on tuesday yeah and it runs until saturday afterwards which hopefully I will not be there for. Um, you know, there's going to be laptop announcements from everybody, Asus, Dell, HP, Lenovo. Um, I really want to see what Qualcomm's going to announce, uh, especially because they've been doing these really fascinating chipsets for, uh, you know, true wireless in-ear monitors. Um, there's, and then there's, there's, it's going to be really curious, right? Because the current status, you know, is 2,200 vendors. Last week it was 1,900 vendors, which is huge, except that, you know, pre-pandemic they were looking around 4,000 4,500 vendors right so yeah. big but way smaller than than they had been um you know it's Procter and Gamble is one of the names that keeps popping up John Deere uh you know uh, they've been there for several years Deuce and Bobcat I guess they're going to announce an electric skid steer uh which I like the idea of an electric skid steer uh innovation awards are already out for Colgate Palmolive's hum smart rhythm toothbrush which you can actually buy have been oh, able to there's buy been a smart a toothbrush in those innovation awards for like the past yeah, five it's like, years. Yeah, it's like smart rhythm. Yeah. I always, I always laugh because I people are like, you know, we got an innovation award. I'm like, don't you pay for those? And then there's like, uh, <laughs> and I don't, I don't back know, back I don't know if anybody back. pays for those or how that works. But you know, it's always funny to see that. Like L'Oreal has their water saver hair wash system. There's like a massive multinational <laughs> consulting firm that's a big. So it's CES is this weird mixture at this point of of not just traditional what we think of as tech, but you know more mainstream non technical companies that have tech leaking in all over the place. And of course, uh, the folks at the CEA CES have been pushing hard to get more and more automotive vendors in there. Um, more you know, consumer I, electronics, you know, going back toward kind of steering back that direction yeah. than the Comdex replacement that it became for several years. Yeah, and there's still a lot of Comdexy stuff. There's still a lot yeah, of computer yeah. stuff there. Uh, but there's, you know, it's it's kind of it's always funny to see what filters in uh, as the press releases start going out, or what kind of starts showing up in your inbox. Um, you know, I mean, bringing it back to home theater, I think the biggest thing for a lot of people listening right now is, you know, CES is coming. Do I wait to see what the new televisions are going to be for next year, or do I buy a television now? Um, you know, how long you can hold on the cheap television prices. I was going to say, isn't the answer you know, like buy now unless you could wait a year anyway? Like, 
CES stuff doesn't always come out fast, although it's been getting better about that, I guess. It's been getting better, but it's, I still feel comfortable in saying, like, if you can't wait until June, buy now. Uh, yeah, all right. You know, all right. That's, that's, a good, that's a good benchmark. You know. Well, I can't wait to see your unboxing of your complimentary COVID-19 self-test. <laughs> Comes with you want bag. me to do that? I'll do that for you, Tom. Please do. Yeah. Abbott's an exhibitor, by the way. And when you pick up your badge, apparently you're going to be getting, well, let me read this out. Attendees will be provided with an Abbott Binax Now COVID-19 self-test kit. Each Binax Now self-test kit contains two tests, which can be used twice while attending the show. Mm, um, very good. Yeah. Yeah, it was a weird. That's smart. Moment. I'm good. That's a good idea. Yeah. I'm glad they're doing that. Me too. Well, uh, a company that for sure paid for this uh, is Samsung. And what I'm talking about is Samsung they didn't pay signing- They for us to talk about it. They, no, yeah. they, they paid the, the other company in question. Samsung has signed a multi-year deal to be the official display and tech partner for City Fields in Queens, New York. If you're from Queens, you know what I'm already talking about, but if not, that is where the New York Mets baseball team plays. Over the next two years, Samsung will install more than 1,300 LCD screens and 4,000 square feet of LED screens in public spaces. Some of them will be used for things like helping fans pick the shortest food lines, letting fans know which team merchandise is ready for pickup, just crowd control, really. Basically, replacing static signage with interactive displays. There's also an IPTV system to deliver nearly 100 channels of sports and entertainment because when you go to a Mets game... You need other options. Yeah, when you're at the bar for the field boxes <laughs> at City yeah. Field, you want to yeah. catch up on. Uh, I and want a hundred like channels and yeah. nothing less. Uh, for the game itself, there will be twice the number of replay cameras and three times the cameras for game coverage. So it really is centered on the game itself that you're there for. And of course, there will be a new center field scoreboard, score, which will be a uh, 4K LED. So nice and crisp. Yeah. They also have Max Scherzer. That doesn't have anything to do with Samsung, though. Um, I, uh, you know, this is a this is a big press release uh, splash for Samsung because they they're doing a sports team. I, I, I get that, but uh, it does sound like there's some interesting stuff here as far as crowd management, line management. Uh, anybody who's been to any of that, concert, sports, whatever, knows that when you get to the food line. Well, stadiums aren't always the best at making it clear, like which line is the shortest and how to get your stuff. Uh, and, and in a world of trying to do a, as little contact as possible, yeah. you know, having a pickup situation where like, OK, you want to you want to get this this jersey with Scherzer's name on it. Great. We've got your order. Look at the screen. It'll tell you when it's ready, you, which window you go pick it up on. That's great. I feel like um, airports, um, large venues such as City Field, great examples where, you know, we don't we don't have a blanket system for everything, but there will be one that says, well, you know, look at the United Terminal at JFK. Pretty good. <laughs> right. You know, and, and you know, everyone kind of goes, yeah, that's amazing. It makes everything so much better. There are all these automated ways that, uh, you know, if, you, if you're, you know, one among you know a bunch of people trying to get to where you're going um, and sort of confused, uh, it is super helpful. Uh, this is a great example of that. We hope. I am only. <laughs> we, we hope. Yes. I'm only looking at the scoreboard and wondering why it's 4K, not 8K. Like, there, if there's any use case because for an 8K Mets, screen Tom. right now, well, it would be the the scoreboard. Like, that's the yeah. only place where it would make sense at the moment. I, on one hand, yes. On the other hand, nobody's actually sitting close enough to the scoreboard to actually take advantage of it. The, the scoreboard could be 720p and be quite legible for the vast majority right. of the people looking at it. I was so wait, also, you're saying Samsung is is being practical by making a 4K LED screen instead of uh, going for like high numbers that will look good in a press release? I'm sure. You know, at this point, you know, when you when you look at these these pictures on the on the press page for it. Yeah, like I was thinking about this and, you know, we're all talking about all of the, 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 the behind the scenes, the crowd management, the displays. And then I'm looking at this and I'm realizing they're ringing like every level of the stadium with monitors because they have yeah. these big orange, like these are the monitors. Look at the big orange stripes. And part of me is also like every home run, a potential screen smashing. Yeah, you know, like I'm wondering what they're going to do to protect all of these monitors. Uh, they got so baseballs. many nets and stuff up there. Yeah, home runs might be the only the only thing you have to worry about. Which, um, 
Oh, I was going to make a Mets won't hit enough home runs to make a difference joke, but they probably will. So Well, and also, see, they play against people, and maybe the uh, other people yeah. are good at hitting the yeah. home Wouldn't run. Wouldn't be the Cardinals, but somebody will hit home runs. Yeah. Mets, <laughs> now that we've upset everyone in the conversation. Um, but I, I also, don't hate the, the Mets. I don't know what Tom's problem is. They're fine. It's 1986. <laughs> That's my problem. I'll get over it one day. <laughs> no, you won't. You will go to your grave being angry about that. I've stopped uh, using the phrase pawn scum in relation to them. That's progress. That actually is big progress. I also yeah. want to I also want to have the, you know, break a Samsung screen to yeah, like, <laughs> Actually, you know, that's what you your... do, right? You break a Samsung, you get a Samsung. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag. Sarah, what do we got over there? Uh, this one came in from Tid Gooby in Discord, actually, because there are some really great feedback that goes in our disc, uh, Discord as well, and we like to highlight it on the show whenever we can. Tid Gooby said, I want to support my local paper, but I constantly hit that paywall, even though I'm a paid subscriber. They can't seem to keep me logged in, and I'm not that interested in the articles, so I'm considering canceling. I... I'm not going to cancel, but I do feel punished as a person following the rules sometimes. Uh, sure. I subscribe to the Los Angeles Times, uh, the local paper where I'm at, and I have to pretty much read it on my phone because whenever I'm on a browser, it's forgotten that I logged in. Uh, or I'm, I'm, I'm in like Feedly, which is like not keeping logins, right? It's like, oh, I'm sorry. You have to log in. I'm like, I don't want to yeah. log in right we now. Just forget you. it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to bother with it. So yeah, there, there needs to be a better way to authenticate that I have, have paid for this. They sure do. Especially because, you know, my local paper as well, it's, I mean, it's not a tiny paper. Um, it serves, you know, several hundred thousand people, but it, uh, same issue. Same issue. I pay for it. I feel that the paper deserves my money. And, you know, it's those people who are consistently saying, well, we can't uh, afford to keep going because we don't have enough people supporting us. And I want to support you, paper. So yeah. <laughs> help me help you. Make it easy. I certainly had to log back in the dispatch at least once in the last 12 months. I don't remember if it was on my I think it was on my phone. Not Just on my once? Desktop. Maybe twice. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they're less secure. Maybe the papers you guys are dealing with and, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, Tid Gubby, maybe, maybe y'all have more secure paper environments than I do, or, or maybe I should, you know, clear out my cash. <laughs> good morning. How's your world today? The post. Look at that. That's pretty good. Well, listen, if you have feedback, if you'd like to send us an email, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com would be a great place. If you are in our Discord, there's always conversations going on there, and we we do our best to uh, make sure that we're up on all of them. And thank everybody in advance uh, for being such great conversationalists, and keep it coming. We also want to extend a very special thanks to Jonathan. Jonathan is one of our top lifetime supporters for Ooh. DTNS. Thank you for all the years of support, Jonathan. Yay, Jonathan. Woo, 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 woo. Jonathan. I mean, it, and we appreciate new supporters too. So if you became a patron right now, you might get the applause on Monday. Absolutely. New, new and old. Uh, uh, Love them all. Welcome the flock. Uh, thanks also to Patrick Norton. Patrick, I know you're kind of gearing up for the holidays and or CES, but where can people keep up with everything that you're doing? Uh, Probably the easiest way is just to go to twitter.com slash Patrick Norton because I am at Patrick Norton, or you can head over to avxl.com. Uh, that's or just searching your favorite podcatcher for avxl. It's the home theater and audio podcast I host with Mr. Robert Heron. And it's a very good one. Everybody check it out if you haven't already. Uh, for us on this show, we are live Monday through Friday at 4 30 p.m. Eastern, 21 30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. If you haven't joined us live before, it's pretty fun. Give it a try. We will see you on Monday. Have a great weekend, everyone. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer Joe Kuntz. 
Associate producer Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer Jen Cutter. Science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott S. One, BioCal, Captain Kipper, Jack Shid, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show included Rob Dunwood, Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Patrick Norton. And our guest on this week's show was Nicole Lee. Thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this broker. <laughs>